So hello everybody, welcome to uh, welcome to Van Hoover. My name is Joel, otherwise known as the Unshaken VA, and today I am here to uh, present a brief crash course in Brony history. Um, so the panel is going to be nine minutes long itself, and then there is going to be a follow-up afterward where you can uh, ask questions in follow-up. So um, let's get straight into this. Let me pull up my notes here and we shall begin. Uh, hold on. Okay, here we go. What? Where's Google Docs? No. Okay. Ah, <clears throat> uh, shoot. Uh, we're having some technical difficulties. We'll be right back. Okay, come on, come on, come on, please. Please, please hurry. There we go, okay. Um, fudge. All right. Jesus, please, your Lord God, please let this Lord Jesus in your name, I pray, Lord God. Amen. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Joel, and welcome to uh, a brief history on bronies. Um, so a lot of you are just joining the fandom for the first time, and you're wondering, what is this all about? Who are bronies? That is what this uh, panel is here to talk about today. So this is going to be a brief introduction to the history of the bronies, and then afterwards, uh, we will hop in voice chat, and if any of you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Just a warning, um, there is going to be some mentions of a material that may be found offensive to some people. Uh, this is not intentional. Uh, we are going to be discussing a brief part of Brony history, which involves 4chan, and unfortunately, that means discussing the negative parts of, of 4chan as well. Um, but that will be a very brief part of the entire panel. So here we go. If you've been alive since the 1980s, you've most likely heard of a line of toys for little girls with the title... My Little Pony. In its earliest stages, the show and toys were perceived as very feminine, enforcing and lengthening girly stereotypes for the sake of making a quick dollar. In the 2010s, however, My Little Pony would have a facelift and change the world of pop culture forever. An unexpected turn of events would bring thousands of people together from all over the world, and lifelong friendships would be formed, for better or for worse. In this speech, I am here to inform you, my audience, about the history of the group of adult fans of My Little Pony, as well as touch on creative endeavors and contributions to society made by these fans. So without further ado, let's get into it. This is a crash course on brony history. In 2008, Hasbro and Discovery Channel team up to create a robust new block of children's television programming, dubbed The Hub Network. This channel would feature brand new Hasbro shows based off of their classic toy lines, such as Pound Puppies and Transformers Prime. Of course, they also secured the rights to show reruns of classic shows, such as Animaniacs and, of course, Fraggle Rock. Meet Lauren Faust. She is renowned for her work on such shows as Powerpuff Girls and Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, both of which were created by her husband, Craig McCracken. She also worked as an animator on the hit film The Iron Giant. 
One day, Hasbro approaches Lauren Faust and asks her to create a new iteration of the My Little Pony television show. And you can see here, this was her original treatment of the show, which was created and developed in 2008. And the concept art is really interesting. Um, originally, Fluttershy and Applejack were supposed to be Earth ponies. Uh, you had Rarity and Twilight as unicorns. Of course, Twilight had a different color scheme. And Trixie's cutie mark, which is interesting. On the subject of Trixie, allegedly she was also originally supposed to be a male character. And then, of course, you had Pinkie Pie as a Pegasus, which is very unusual. Um, when we look at it today, but back then, that was what the original plan for the show was. So, moving on from there, she sets to work, and on October 10th, 2010, the Hub Network premieres the first two episodes of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic to the World. Now, to this day, nobody quite knows what made this show so special. Why did this show specifically change the course of pop culture as we know it? What was so appealing? Was it the fresh new character designs, which looked more feline in comparison to other iterations of the show? Maybe it was the voice cast, composed of voice acting veterans such as Tara Strong, who you may know from shows such as Powerpuff Girls and Teen Titans Go, or just Teen Titans. Um, perhaps it was the writing, which now integrated scenes of heavy cartoon violence into the new show, such as this season from such as this episode from season four. Uh, whatever the case, its appeal played some part in My Little Pony catching the attention of 4chan. 4chan was a large message board website that is still running to this day. Usually, citizens of 4chan discussed politics, talked about anime, some got in trouble with the police, and for some reason, some anonymous users on the board decided to check out this new show by Lauren Faust. At first, they were viewing it for the sake of irony, mirthless laughs and giggles, but what these 4chan goers didn't expect was that they would find themselves enjoying the show. As I was doing extensive research for this panel, I found that this was the earliest, um, this was the earliest uh, discussion on the show that I could find on 4chan. So you had what appears to be these bronies talking about the show as it aired. Uh, as you can see, this was around October 10th, just as the show was airing. Um, and they were discussing the fact that they got cliffhangered by the pilot. Um, from that point on, a small fan base rapidly began forming in the depths of 4chan as people scrambled to check out this new show. Now, something to note about 4chan is that the people here really love memes. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary has two definitions for the word meme. However, in the context of this historical narrative, we want to focus on the second definition. An interesting or amusing item, or an amusing or interesting item, such as a caption picture or video, or genre of items that is spread widely online, especially through social media. One example of a meme that you may have heard of is this little guy, Pepe the Frog, who was made infamous for all the wrong reasons by, for, by 4chan. Originally, Pepe was created by artist Matt Fury in an original comic book for college students entitled Boys Club. The image of this frog, unfortunately, was taken by 4chan, ripped from the hands of its creator, and twisted around for the sake of hatred and racism in 4chan, particularly that of the neo-Nazi agenda. Now, while some memes on 4chan are harmless enough, others are rumored to have been involved with the current election of the president. But that's another story for another time. Naturally, it was only fitting that some would begin to make relatively harmless memes using screenshots from My Little Pony. No hatred, no racism, just harmless memes. One day, several Anons, or anonymous users, were working together to create memes, when one remarked by saying, Thanks for the help, pony bro. Another, adding on to the joke, replied, more like brony, am I right, fellas? Now here is where everything began to change. These three didn't know it yet, but they had just changed the course of the fandom's history. And thus, the bronies were born. This is Sethisto. Deep in the bowels of 4chan, Sethisto desired a way to keep up with news about the television show that both himself and other fans could keep an eye on for potential new content. So, Sethisto creates a blog page called Equestria Daily, a sort of play on words, if you will. Equestria being the name of the fictional world of the show, and Daily being posted on the end, similar to newspapers, such as the Daily Tribune or Sacramento Bee. One notable thing to add about this website is that throughout the entire run of the cartoon, Equestria Daily would post a pirated copy of each episode for fans to watch. You see, around this time, not everybody could afford cable or Netflix, but thanks to Equestria Daily, a bit shoot or daily motion link would appear with a copy of the episode shortly after it aired. As people kept coming back to Equestria Daily, they kept talking with friends and family, and inevitably, things would reach the point where people would begin hosting meetups for fans of the show. And that takes us into part two, conventions and the brony hierarchy. 
In 2011, the first Brony convention was held in Manhattan, New York, with an attendance of just over 90 people. Of course, just months prior, there was a small meetup held with 30 or so members in attendance. The original Brony convention scene was very cozy. Fans would play video games, eat pizza, and even paint and personalize their own My Little Pony figurines. Everything changed, however, in 2012, when John Delancey, who some of you may know as Q from Star Trek, became the primary villain of Season 2 of My Little Pony. There was more honey to sweeten the pot, however, he, as he, he would be a keynote speaker at the 2012 meetup, and, a, be a, and he would be accompanied by the creator of the show herself, Lauren Faust. Upon hearing this news, thousands scrambled to purchase tickets. When 2012 BronyCon finally rolled around, roughly 4,000 people attended in person, and about 3,500 were able to watch the live stream from, of the keynote from the comfort of their own homes. A quick side note, during the panel, an evacuation had to be executed due to a fire hazard. One of the light fixtures had somehow caught a flame, and the entire convention had to exit the building until this was fixed. Hazards seem to be a common thing among brony conventions. According to Jenny Nicholson's analysis video, The Last BronyCon, a fandom autopsy, a concert was being held at a later convention on one of the upper floors of the hotel. There were so many people jumping to the music that it was disturbing guests, and hotel management was afraid that the floor would cave in. Because of this, management interrupted the concert to ask that the bronies please refrain from jumping for the sake of their safety, the safety of the hotel patrons, and the safety of the musicians and their equipment. From that point on, whenever a song ended for the rest of the concert, rather than jump and cheer, the bronies would chant, please don't jump, please don't jump. Many of these incidents that happened at the convention would become memes, with fan, with fan art even, even being sold of said events. One thing that commonly happened during these events is that a charity auction or fundraiser would be held to donate money to various organizations, such as Toys for Tots or Cancer Research. The average Brony convention usually raised $18,000 or more. Now, on the subject of the fans themselves, there are multiple people who make up the fandom's hierarchy. You had your casual fans, people who simply enjoyed the show and the community surrounding it. These types of people included bronies who had served in the military. You also had the Pegasisters, who were just as prominent in the fandom as the bronies, but unfortunately, some saw the Pegasisters as a minority, although this is completely untrue. After casual fans, you had the content creators, or creative types. Thousands of pieces of pony fan art are churned out each year. Some are original works, such as this piece by deviant artist GIGN3208, entitled Octavia. Other works would parody or cross over with already existing properties. If you were to go into the internet and type in a combination of word such as a combination of words such as My Little Pony and Star Wars, suddenly hundreds of drawings will show up depicting Jedi ponies and rabbit droids. These artworks will usually be posted on 4chan, but can also find heavy residency on art forms such as Deviant Art and, of course, a platform that was spe made specifically for bronies entitled Derpy Boru, a pony-based image board. Aside from artworks, many people crafted handmade pony plush. You see, Hasbro's officially licensed plush don't look accurate enough to the fans. Uh, this is the expectation, and this is the, the sad, sad reality, because mass production is not cheap. Um, if you wanted to buy a show-accurate plush, one could easily assume it would run you $200 or more. Because they were in such high demand and would be so expensive to make, a good portion of that money would be used to buy more materials to keep making plush. It wasn't an uncommon thing to make some plush of your own original character. Some fans would draw or create their own character and want to have a plush commissioned of it. And again, this would cost a small fortune. Here, for example, we can see Blackjack, an original character from the My Little Pony fanfiction, Fallout Equestria, created by Cassie's Plush Emporium on May 29th, 2017. As you can see, it is show accurate. Most likely there were some wires used to mold the tail and mane. Um, you can see that a lot of detail went into sewing the head and this has a lot of care put into it. Um, at the top of the brony hierarchy, you had the musicians. These bohemians would begin by remixing songs from the television show at first, but would eventually expand their creative view and write original songs based off of their favorite characters or episodes. Some of these songs were so well written that the outsider wouldn't be able to tell it was based off of a show for little girls. Such songs included Discord, which became a fandom anthem written by Eurobeat Brony and later remixed by The Living Tombstone, who was famous on the internet to this day for his amazing remixes both in the Brony fandom and outside of it. Uh, you also had heartwarming, heartwarming ballads like Great To Be Different, written by transgender artist Forrest Rain. 
This would also become an anthem to the bronies, encouraging living out your life the way you want to, despite people criticizing your quirks or differences. Aside from songs, some people would write full-blown albums or musical concepts. A man named Garrison Ulrich, who goes by the alias of Forever Free Brony, wrote a 40-minute album that featured original music, but also a tribute to the late David Bowie near the end of the album's runtime. This album was about a pony who traveled to the moon to combat her depression. Meanwhile, a composer who went by the name L-Train wrote three symphonic operas, all based off of the show, but would retell these little-known stories in a sung-through format. For example, up here you can see Fall of an Empire, my personal favorite. This was a Romeo and Juliet-esque tale about a king and a princess who fell in love. And again, all four of these al albums are still free to listen to on YouTube. They are great listens and I would highly recommend them. Um, the ki Although the princess was immortal, the king was not, and this caused a barrier between the two, resulting in the king's hostile takeover and eventual demise of the kingdom. Brony music was very prominent on the art scene, and like the plushes and drawings, is still created by hundreds to this day. Some artists will even go on to work for Hasbro on the show itself, while others were approached by animation companies outside of Hasbro. Aside from musicians, you had fan animators, people who published their own My Little Pony fan fictions, and many more bronies who worked in the different genres of content creation. However, no matter what content was made by who, the message is clear. Every fan belongs, and everyone has something to contribute to the brony community. Part 3. Conclusions 2019. The bronies wait with bated breath for the end of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, which was announced to have a final season in its ninth. The final brony convention was held in 2019 with 10,215 attendees. The charity auction, as expected, raised roughly $80,000. Tears were shed and emotions ran high. The closing ceremonies had to be live-streamed to a second room in the convention center due to the overabundance of attendees. BronyCon went out with a bang. And then, on October 12th, 2019, almost 10 years later, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic ended with a four-episode finale. It was over. The show was finished. So what now? Community. Despite the show ending, fans keep turning out pieces of art. They still make plush and sing songs and create parody videos. Some even go on to create breathtaking original animations. If you're looking for good examples of these, I would highly recommend, um, I would highly recommend Minty Root. Uh, they do some great animation. Uh, there were highs and lows, but friends stuck together and saw it through. The bronies aren't as prominent in pop culture now as they were back then, but they still have each other. And at the end of the day, fellowship is enough. Thank you. All right, so that is the end of the Crash Course in Brony History. Um, I am now going to hop into the Sunny Showers voice chat, and if anyone would like to ask any questions, uh, feel free to. So let's hop in here. And um, once again, I am in the Sunny Showers voice chat for anyone who, for anyone who has any questions. While we are waiting, I would like to show you a couple of pieces of pony fan art that are actually really cool. Um, so first, let's go check out YouTube over here. And one of my personal favorite animations is Lullaby for a Princess, which I believe is made by Crown Prince, but I might be wrong. So, okay, it was created by Warpout. So Warpout worked on this animation for three years. According to the behind the scenes, he spent... He spent every day for three years painting 12, um, 12 frames, and the result is really amazing. So, again, while we are waiting for people to join the voice chat uh, down in sunny showers, we will watch this animation. It's really amazing.
I'd like to point out too just how much detail is went into this animation. Like it's really well done. I would highly recommend checking it out yourself. All right, so we have ten minutes left for this panel. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, uh, I am down in the sunny showers voice chat. Uh, we've got people in the chat here. Uh, Lumit the Kieran says, first time I heard and watched this, I cried so hard. There was a lot of emotion. Uh, same here. This is a really great animation. Like, it deserves way more attention than it has. Interestingly enough, um, after working on this, he actually, the, from what I hear, um, he went and actually had offers to work like at an actual animation studio. I'm not sure which one, um, but I know that he did get job opportunities after this, which I think is really cool. Um, that like making something like this can lead to such great job opportunities. This is the best scene. Uh, yes, this is 38 million views. So arguably, this is one of the most iconic Brony fan-made videos uh, that have ever graced the internet. And deservedly so, too, because the quality, again, is amazing. Is it playing in HD? Oh yeah, it is. This is gonna go higher. Oh, there we go. My banner still. Oh, I am so sorry. Sorry. I, I completely forgot about the banner. I am so sorry. I'm getting a notification that I have six minutes left to stream, um, so we'll finish up this video and then check out a couple others. And again, I want to apologize to the chat um, for the technical issues with this stream. Um, I had two channels prepared and I forgot to remove the bottom third banner, so that obstructed the majority of the view, and I'm really sorry. Yeah, that is uh, Lullaby for a Princess, again, created by Warpout. Um, the song was written by Ponyphonic. I would highly recommend checking out this video. It is breathtaking and it blows you away every time.
All right, so again, there are, uh, there are many great examples of videos um, that have been made by Bernies in the past that are highly iconic. Uh, let's look at one, for example, by Don Somewhere. Um, Don Somewhere, for those of you who don't know, is a, he, he made a lot of parodies of the show. And um, they were very well received because of how hilarious they are. Uh, so for example, let's uh, take a look at this one. This is called Alicorn Day. Um, the art was made by, Patri by uh, Pederup, and again, it was written by Greg. Um, and so in this video, you have Twilight uh, pre-season three um, receiving a mysterious potion from Celestia. Uh, this came for you. Uh, so hey, you remember that one that she sent you where she asked you to get those pictures of Applejack's brother? Yeah. And then she told you to write a critique on Mac's physical appearance? Yeah. Then she sent your critique to Mac? Yeah. What'd you tell her you learned from that? A Philip screwdriver uh, is CR in the chat, yes, his cynic humor is also very well crafted. charges out the butt for stuff I really think she should do as a friend. So, what's this one then? It says, drink this, then tell me what you learn. All right, hang on. And here's a bucket. Okay, go ahead. Oh, Ugh, it's got an aftertaste. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, I see you didn't barf up the spell. Uh, I know she can make these potions palatable. Anything happen? Hi, but... Truth be told, it's come so far out of left field for me, I don't actually have any feelings about it. What? <laughs> oh. What? Wait. What? Pretty much what I was thinking. <laughs> no one's gonna understand, but here we are. So, uh, what now, Alicorn Princess? Envy of little girls everywhere? Sorry. I... Uh... I just turned into an alicorn today. I'm not used to the wings. Yeah, so it's like different being an alicorn. I was thinking about maybe what I could do with the new powers, like maybe I could use them in some awesome battle to get something I like. Hey, now that I'm a god, from now on, you're gonna give me my books for free. See, but then I can't think of anything where violence is really gonna benefit me in the long run. Hey, come on, you don't have to close down. I'll pay normal price, I'll pay. Okay, fine, I'll pay double. I mean, I always had potential to be violent. Yes, CR, I, is that, I believe that is a Scooter Tricks Maybe reference. Now it's worse. Um, you keep the bookstore open! You keep the bookstore open, or I will summon the king in yellow into your left ear! So you're an alicorn now, huh? Yep. Are you one forever? I don't know. Yeah. Well, it, your wings are really cool. Yeah, I guess they're okay. You could get around really fast with those, I bet. I guess that's true. Oh, I actually, I um, I actually something. did some light voice work in Scooter Tricks for, uh, Sorry, Scooter Tricks the movie. Right now and I um, so it. it was the scene with Trixie, uh, hanging out in the, the void with the Wonderbolts, and I played Angel with It was a lot of fun. Um, I would definitely do it again. spells for fixing clothes. That's another one too. We don't have time to show it here, but if you, if you guys want to check it out, I would highly recommend Scooter Tricks the Abridged. Um, it is the first Pony Abridged series, I believe, that actually completed its story arc, and it was very well done, very well made. Um, all right, so that concludes our panel. And um, we have two minutes left, but we are going to leave those over to Affinity. Uh, so thank you guys again for joining me in this brief history of the Bronies, and I will see you all later. Uh, I will be hanging out in VR chat. Uh, down in VC if you guys want to join. Thank you again, and uh, God bless. Oh, also, uh, I would highly recommend checking out PBN's work. He did draw this uh, Trixie graphic for me, and it was, again, very well crafted. Thank you.